So week one of the 2020 NFL season is officially in the books, which, and now it is time to move on to week two. Before I get into picking and predicting all the games on Sunday, I'm going to give you a quick recap of the Thursday night game between the Cleveland Browns and the Cincinnati Bengals. Both teams were coming into this game 0-1. The Browns, after getting shellacked by the Ravens, were in desperate need of a win here. For the Browns, you have avoided what was essentially a absolute worst case scenario here. Had the Browns lost this game, you would have seen DEFCON levels of panic among Cleveland Browns fans this morning. But the story of this game for me was Baker Mayfield. Mayfield really looked good. He was getting outside the pocket. He was making throws into tight windows. He was accurate. He was poised. He really looked a lot like the Baker Mayfield of his rookie season. We also had an Odell Beckham Jr. sighting in this game, catching four passes for 74 yards and a touchdown. He was their leading receiver on the game. Also, Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt both ran for a combined 210 yards and three touchdowns. And as for the Bengals... There's still, there's still really a long way to go for this team. Joe Burrow did actually play a really good game. I thought he looked a lot better than he did in his week one debut. He looked poised, he was escaping pressures, and he was making some really good throws into tight coverages. Really good reads, too. I mean, he was going through his reads and he was finding open receivers. Joe Burrow really looked good. But there's still big problems on this Bengals team. Their offensive line was horrendous. They could not get anything going on the run game. And the defense could not get any timely stops when they really needed them the most. And even when the Bengals were able to get an interception off Baker Mayfield, one of his few mistakes of the game, Joe Burrow was able to just march his team down the field for a huge touchdown to get his team back in the game late in the fourth quarter. That was a big boy drive for Joe Burrow, by the way, and I was seriously impressed while I was watching that. But after they score that touchdown to make it 28-23 to with about, I don't know, I think it was like six minutes to go in the game at that point, the Browns just ran all over the Cincinnati defense. The Bengals defense did not have any answers for for Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt, and the Browns were able to run up the field with relative ease and ultimately put this game out of reach with a Kareem Hunt touchdown run. So yeah, defense, especially that run defense, is a big concern for the Bengals, and the offensive line, I cannot stress enough, huge, 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 huge concern for this Bengals offense. Because not only could they get anything going on the run, but Joe Burrow, I mentioned, he was escaping pressures a lot. He, he was doing that a lot. They, the Browns' pass rush was getting home to Burrow a lot in this game. So there are still issues to be worked out for sure. Another concern for the Bengals is injuries. They had two wide receivers go off the field with injuries, including C.J. Ozuma, who I think at the time was their leading receiver when he got carted off the field with a leg injury. And the last thing I want to mention about Joe Burrow and the Bengals before we move on to the rest of the video is just how resilient they were. I mean, Joe Burrow brings them back to within a touchdown with that big drive that I mentioned earlier. And then the Browns just run all up and down the field on Cincinnati and score what would ultimately be the game-deciding touchdown. He came right back and he drove the Bengals down the field for another touchdown to make it 35-30. to Now, obviously, it was too little too late at that point. I gotta give him credit. I gotta admire the resilience of Joe Burrow. He did not quit. He kept driving this football team down the field for scoring drives. And I think if you're a Bengals fan there's one takeaway that you can come away from this game with to be encouraged by, it was the performance of Joe Burrow. And for the Browns, this is a, like I said, this is crisis averted for now. You're one and one, pretty much back to square one at this point. You got a winnable game coming up with the Washington football team coming to town with extra time to prepare. So at least for now, things can settle down. All's right with the world for now out in Cleveland. And if Baker Mayfield can continue to perform the way he performed last night on a consistent basis throughout the season, then I think the Browns will be just fine. And I'm going to leave it at that. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start predicting all of the football games that will be played on Sunday. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. And of course, let's go Beals.
That's going to bring us to your Buffalo Bills. Heading on the road for the first time to take on the Miami Dolphins. Now the Bills were able to take care of business at home against the Jets in a game that probably shouldn't have been as close as it was. Whereas the Dolphins came out looking pretty flat against a Patriots team that I still don't believe is all that good. Cam Newton was able to do a good amount of running the ball in that game and his QB with his QB options and all that stuff. And that's not going to get any easier when Josh Allen comes to town. Now if I'm the Bills, I'm looking to see if I can get my run game going after getting stifled by the Jets in week one. But Josh Allen was able to make up for that by running for 57 yards on his own and throwing the ball for over 300 yards, making him the first Bills QB to do that since 2016. Josh Allen also made his fair share of some deeply concerning mistakes, which he was prone to at times last season, which included two lost fumbles and an egregious miss in the back of the end zone to a wide open John Brown. But the biggest concern of them all for the Bills is the injury status of Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano, both of whom left the game last week not to return. Luckily, the update from uh, the Bills practice is that both those guys are day-to-day, -day, so that's very good news. Matt Milano is a hamstring injury, and uh, as last year showed, the Bills like to be a lot more cautious with the soft tissue injuries, so I wouldn't expect to see him playing in this game. But if Tremaine Edmonds is day-to-day, -day, then there's a very good chance that we could see him on Sunday, which would be excellent news for the Bills, and it's even better news knowing what's coming up on the horizon. I'm going to pick the Bills to win this game, and please, for my own sanity and the sanity for all my fellow Bills fans, please don't make this a close game. And now on to the rest of the games, and we will start in the NFC as the New York Giants head out to the Windy City to take on the Chicago Bears. The Bears are 1-0 thanks to some fourth quarter heroics by Mitchell Trubisky, and the Giants did not prove to be much of a match for that very formidable Steelers defense on Monday night. Now, there were certainly some reasons to be encouraged by Daniel Jones' development in his first game of his sophomore season, but that interception on the goal line was a ball that never should have been thrown, and it absolutely cost the Giants that football game. So he really got the good and the bad of Daniel Jones in the first game of the season, whereas Mitch Trubisky is playing for his job with Nick Foles looming over his head on every drop back. And it was a solid week one performance. Most of his production came in that fourth quarter, but he came up big when he needed to, and that go-ahead touchdown pass to Anthony Miller was absolutely beautiful. If Trubisky can replicate that performance in Week 2, then I don't foresee them having any difficulty moving the ball against a Giants defense that quite simply does not have the talent to stand up to most NFL attacks. Also, Saquon Barkley was absolutely stonewalled, only gaining 6 yards on what I think was 13 carries. The Giants have to get Barkley going if they're going to have a chance against the Bears, or for the remainder of the season. But I have to pick the Bears again. The Giants still have a lot of holes on that roster. Their defense, in my opinion, is one of the worst in the league. And I don't see how the Bears don't go 2-0 here. Up next, we have the Rams going on the road for the first time to take on the Eagles, who are still reeling from that upset they suffered at the hands of the Washington football team. And the Rams are coming off a huge win against the Cowboys and are looking to build some early momentum. And looking at week one in a vacuum, the Rams clearly looked like the superior football team. The Eagles offense struggled to score points against Washington's defense in week one, and now they have to take on a Rams defense that looked completely revitalized last Sunday night. With a pass rush led by Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey emerging as the lockdown corner of this team. Jared Goff had a solid start to the season as well, and he needed that to bounce back from what was a down 2019 campaign. And if he can continue that performance and build off of it in the next few weeks, then the Rams are absolutely a playoff team, in my opinion. As for the Eagles, I wouldn't press the panic button just yet. Yes, it was a very bad loss, but it's only week one. I expect you to bounce back. You're in a pretty weak division, and I don't expect Washington to stay in front of you very long this season. But I am going to pick the Rams here. I think they are a more reliable football team, and the Eagles are incredibly banged up on the offensive line, which will be a feeding ground for the Rams' pass rush if they aren't careful. Next, we have the 49ers coming out east to visit the Jets. Both teams are coming off a loss. As the Jets got wiped by the Bills in Orchard Park, and the 49ers got shocked by the Arizona Cardinals. But I don't see an upset coming up at this time around. This is a buzzsaw for the Jets. The Niners already had a chip on their shoulder going into Week 1 after their Super Bowl loss, but after losing that game that they were favored to win at home, 
they are going to give absolutely no quarter to the Jets. If there's reason to be hopeful for the Jets, their run defense did show up to play against the Bills, as I mentioned, and the Niners do like to run the football, so that could play into their hands a little bit especially with all the injuries that they got going on in their receiving core. But the Niners also like to rip off offensive linemen's heads while wearing their quarterback skin as a pelt. So yeah, I'm picking the Niners to win. It's not a difficult decision. The Jets are not the Cardinals. That brings us to the Broncos and the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Broncos suffered a tough loss on Monday night, being unable to prevent a game-winning field goal by the Titans, whereas the Steelers gave a pretty strong showing against the Giants team that still has a lot of issues to work out. Now, in my predictions last week, I greatly downplayed how good this Steelers defense really is, and that was a mistake, because defensively, the Steelers played absolutely lights out. I also wrote Ben Roethlisberger off as an aging quarterback coming off a season in which he missed 14 and a half games. Now, I'll admit, Ben proved me wrong, at least for this week because he looked very sharp, his decision making was solid, and it looked like for the most part he was on the same page with his receivers, which is good to see if you're a Steelers fan. But I'm also not prepared to crown this team yet just because they were able to move the ball against a simply pitiful Giants defense. And keep in mind too that Daniel Jones had marched the Giants inside the Steelers 10 yard line on a 19 play drive and put them in position to take the lead when it was still only a six point game. And were it not for a questionable play call and an even more questionable decision by Daniel Jones to throw an absolute meatball to a Steelers defensive lineman, you're looking at a totally different football game going into that fourth quarter. And that was the turning point of that game, so it's not as if the Steelers just walked into MetLife and absolutely wiped the turf with them. I need to see more of this team before I start to buy into them as a playoff team, much less as Super Bowl contender. And I think the Broncos will be a good test for Ben Roethlisberger. The Broncos defense did a pretty good job keeping the Titans out of the end zone for the most part, only holding them to 13 points up to the end. And they were in a position to go out and win that game on the last drive, but they couldn't get the job done. I'll be interested to see how they perform against the Steelers offense, who are not that different from Tennessee's in that they rely very heavily on the run game, and only ask their quarterback to do enough to make big plays when they need them. I think this will be another low-scoring game. I gotta go with the Steelers, though, because I think that defense will be the best unit on the field. But I'm going to challenge the Steelers offense to go out and make a statement. Drop 30 or 40 points on this banged-up Broncos team, and and show me once and for all that you're for real. And in another battle between two teams coming off of disappointing season openers, we got the Colts and the Vikings. I greatly underestimated how much the Vikings lost on defense over this offseason because they got absolutely carved by Aaron Rodgers last week. Colts, on the other hand, were one of the many week one victims of a shocking upset from a team that had no business defeating them. Phillip Rivers threw two totally costly interceptions, the first of which set up a Jacksonville touchdown, if I'm not mistaken. Both of these teams are looking to bounce back. The Vikings are probably in bigger need of the win here. As they are in a much tougher division, and they got absolutely smacked by Green Bay. Kirk Cousins didn't have a bad game, but that defense was killer for them. Rodgers throws four touchdowns, and you allow over 150 rushing yards. That is a problem. The Colts will be without Marlon Mack probably for the remainder of the season. That's a huge loss for them, but I don't know if I can forgive that performance. As good as Aaron Rodgers and the Packers were in that game, the Vikings just flat out didn't show up. I think I gotta pick the Colts in this one to bounce back. Speaking of those Jaguars, though, who says they're tanking the season away? Whoever was saying that obviously forgot to tell the Jaguars as they stunned the Colts for a 27-20 victory in Week 1. Garner Minshew led the way with three touchdown throws and only one incompletion in the entire ball game. The Jaguars got some big production out of their rookies as well as C.J. Henderson came up with an interception. LaVisca Chenault hauled in a touchdown pass, and I think the second pick on Phillip Rivers was by an undrafted free agent, if I'm not mistaken, and that pretty much sealed the game. As a Jags fan, it has to feel really good to see your young guys make big plays in the first game of the season. I loved Chenault going into the draft, and we saw glimpses of the explosive potential that he provides to this offense. And the Titans are also coming off of a win thanks to some last-second heroics by Steven Goskowski, atoning for what was overall a day to forget for him. But the Titans did not 
look very convincing on Monday night. Yes, Derrick Henry had a huge game, and yes, Ryan Tannehill looked pretty solid, and Corey Davis did catch for over 100 yards, but they just couldn't put the ball in the end zone. And it was a very sloppy football game on Monday night for both sides, but especially the Titans. So I can't say that I would be all that intimidated by this Titans attack if I'm the Jaguars defense, nor do I think this Titans defense is going to really be able to flummox this Jaguars passing attack, provided, of course, they actually play like they played last week. Secondary was a huge Achilles heel for the Titans down the stretch of last season, and it didn't show any signs of improvement against Denver, and they most certainly have the quarterback and the receivers to make play big plays through the air. Minch Garner Minshew is fearless. He is a gunslinger. My heart wants to pick the Jaguars, but my brain is saying to go with the Titans. Ah, screw it. I'm picking the Jaguars. Minshew mania, baby! Up next is the Falcons heading into Jerry World to take on the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas coming off a pretty tough loss against a very game Rams team who were able to keep this high-powered Dallas offense out of the end zone for a majority of that game. On the other side of the ball, Cowboys gave over 400 yards in total offense to a Rams team who struggled mightily a season ago to move the football. But defense is not going to get any easier with Julio Jones and the Falcons coming to town. The exact number of total offense for the Rams on Sunday night was 422. Matt Ryan threw for 450. So the Cowboys will have their work cut out for them trying to contain this Falcons passing attack, but on the flip side, Atlanta's defense isn't nearly as strong as the Rams, so I do think the potential exists for the Cowboys to make their own hay on offense. All that is good for Dallas, but you gotta put the ball in the end zone. That's really all it comes down to. So I'm gonna pick the Cowboys again. As talented as the Falcons are, I don't fully trust this team to go into Dallas and win a game. I just don't. Up next, we have a divisional matchup between the Carolina Panthers and the Tampa Brady Buccaneers. Uh, I just heard it. That is cringe. Panthers came up short in a high-scoring shootout against the Vegas Raiders, while the Buccaneers opened the Tom Brady era with two picks and a loss that was much more lopsided than the score would indicate. Tom Brady did not look on the same page at all with his receivers. He was airmailing passes, missed timings, questionable throwing decisions. It was pretty ugly in spots for that Buccaneers offense. So I give the advantage to Carolina just from an offensive standpoint after free agent ro signing Robbie Anderson caught six balls for 116 yards including a 75-yard touchdown scamper. And he had Christian McCaffrey running for 96 yards and a score, as he does. If the Panthers can get a passing attack going with Anderson, Bridgewater, and DJ Moore, as well as get that same production out of McCaffrey, this could be a very tough team to play against. Now, I do think they will struggle a bit against that Tampa defense that did play quite well against the Saints. But I don't know who's favored in this game, like, officially, but I'm still not sold on this Tampa Bay squad. And the Panthers showed me a bit of moxie last week, so I'm going to go and say that they win this game. I'm also kind of wish-picking that, too, because screw Tom Brady. But moving on, we're going to stay in the NFC, and we have the Packers taking on the Detroit Lions in their home opener of the season. And just looking at the performances of last week, it's hard to make a case for the Lions here. Aaron Rodgers threw four touchdown passes against the Vikings, while the Detroit Lions allowed three touchdown passes against the Bears. And Mitch Trubisky is a much less talented quarterback than Aaron Rodgers. And I'm also still a little cautious about Green Bay, though. You don't want to overreact to week one. And we saw last season that Aaron Rodgers was prone to some slumps. So I'm not ready to jump all over the Packers wave just yet. I need to see some more consistency from Rodgers, but I do like the Packers to win this game. Devontae Adams, I do trust for consistency, and that man played out of his mind last week. Moving on to the 4 o'clock games, it's the Washington football team versus the Arizona Cardinals. Now, I've used the word shock a lot in this video, but I do not think there were two bigger shocks in week one than the unnamed football team from Washington putting up 27 unanswered points to come from behind and beat the defending division champion Eagles, as well as the Arizona Cardinals going into Santa Clara and beating the defending NFC champion 49ers. This is why I love week one football, man. You never know what's going to happen. Of these two surprising 1-0 teams, though, I'm more convinced by the Cardinals. Dwayne Haskins was fine last week, but Kyler Murray can just straight up make plays. He can make plays with his feet. 
He has DeAndre Hopkins to make big plays for him down the field. Also, what was it, 14 catches for 151 yards? Are you kidding me? But for Washington, it's a different formula. You rely on that defense to keep the opposing team off the scoreboard and hope Dwayne Haskins can just do enough to put you in front and not kill you with mistakes. If Washington is going to be more than just a week one surprise, that's going to have to be the recipe. Because if this game comes down to which quarterback can go out and win a football game, I still believe in Kyler Murray over Dwayne Haskins. But I expect that Washington pass rush to make life very uncomfortable for Kyler Murray. I think he can still be coaxed into some mistakes. And Chase Young had a monster performance in his NFL debut. I think this will be a fun game to watch, and I'll be interested to see how it plays out. And I've bemoaned in the first few weeks of the season the overhyped of teams like the Buccaneers and the Steelers and even the Colts to a degree. But I am all aboard this Cardinals hype train. Give me the Cardinals to go 2-0. Up next, we have the Texans hosting the Ravens in their home opener. The Texans are going to be looking to wipe away an all-around uninspired performance in the season kickoff game on Thursday night. But he's not going to be any easier as the Ravens are coming off as easy of a win as you will see against an aimless Browns team. Right off the bat, it's hard to make a case for the Texans in this game. The offense looked really flat without the big playability of DeAndre Hopkins. And that offensive line looked as much of a liability as it did last season for the Texans. Between the penalties and the free runs off the edge that Chief pass rushers had at Deshaun Watson all game. The only advantage I can identify for the Texans is that they've had more time to prepare for this game. But I don't think that's going to matter. The Ravens came in last week with a huge chip on their shoulder after going one and done in the playoffs. They were a team on a mission last week, and they are rolling into Houston now with a ton of momentum and with something to prove. I gotta go with the Ravens here. I just can't pick against them after that performance last week. Speaking of those Chiefs, they go into LA to take on the Chargers. The Chiefs, as I mentioned, took care of business and cruised to victory over the Texans, and the Chargers were on the right side of a missed field goal to squeak out a win against the Bengals. By that synopsis alone, it shouldn't be hard to see who the better team is going to be in this game. Now, I'm not going to regurgitate every single talking point about the Chiefs offense. Yes, they are very good. We know they were going to be really good. But the thing that stood out to me from Thursday was that defense. I don't generally associate good defense with the Chiefs, but they played really well against Houston. If that continues throughout the season, coupled with that Pat Mahomes offense, this team could be actually unstoppable. It's going to take an awful lot for me to pick against the Chiefs this season. I think they're going to win this game pretty easily. Next up is the Patriots heading to Seattle for the Seahawks home opener on Sunday night. I mentioned preseason hype trains earlier. The Patriots are definitely one of those overhyped teams now that they have Cam Newton aboard. Like, wow, they have Cam Newton and they beat the Dolphins. All of a sudden, they're winning the division again. Show me something against Seattle. Maybe I'll start to fear New England again. Because just comparing the rosters pound for pound, I think the Seahawks clearly have a better team. Their quarterback can also run the ball, and he's throwing to a much more talented group of receivers. And the Patriots' defense is still very depleted from the opt-outs and the free agency period that I see no reason why Russell Wilson can't just go ahead and eat their lunch like he did last week. It's a similar situation to the Steelers for the Patriots, I think. I'm not going to crown them because they beat a Dolphins team that is still deep in its rebuild. And even in that game, Miami was still able to hang with them for most of the game, so it was by no means a dominating performance. So show me something against a team like Seattle, and maybe I'll start to take it seriously again. But for now, I'm picking the Seahawks. And that's going to bring us to the Monday night football game where the Las Vegas Raiders are going to christen their new stadium against the New Orleans Saints. And I thought I'd talk about this game outside in the nice, beautiful fall weather we're having here in upstate New York. The Raiders actually looked pretty impressive in their week one win over the Panthers. That was a pretty high scoring offensive shootout that they came up on top. Josh Jacobs looked really strong. The offense was able to put up a bunch of points and gain a ton of yards. But on the flip side of that, their defense also gave up a bunch of points and allowed a ton of yards. So it's really a matter of what's going to give here. Because if the Raiders' defense is going to play like that throughout the entire season, then their offense might very well need to score 30 points a game in order to have a chance. And they're going up against a Saints defense that doesn't give up more than 30 points all that often. The Saints took care of business against Tom Brady and the Bucks, but didn't look all that great at points. There were moments where they looked a little out of sync, but I do believe that they could have very well won that 
game by a lot more than they did. Might just be week one rust, I don't know, but uh, I still like the Saints in this game. But yeah, I'm going to pick the Saints here. I think they're more proven, more battle-tested. The Raiders are still a bit up and coming, and I don't think this is a game that they're really ready to win just yet. But I'm going to leave it at that. That does it for another week, to, that does it for another week of NFL predictions. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments, who's going to win these games. Uh, I hope you enjoy the games on Sunday, and as always, have a blessed week, and we will see you in the next video. Go Bills!